Okay, okay. Hi guys. Thanks for coming. Um, this is for autism. April is uh, Autism Awareness Month, so um, I'm just doing this because I would, I would just like for people to have a better understanding of autism and kind of what it is. A lot of people don't understand like what it is or there's a lot around it. It's a very complex um, brain dis disorder, disconnection. Um, so just to kind of increase awareness about like what, how those disconnections actually are affecting these kids. Um, I would, I have a disclaimer. Uh, if, so the slides are, I'm not going to read directly off of them. So you guys just read them. I'm just going to cover like go over some details of the actual bullet points. Um, and this is my first go at this. Uh, come talk to me after the presentation if you recognize like any discrepancies, if any of you guys have done any reading up about any of the certain areas that I'm gonna be talking about and you just wanna talk to me about it or see if there's anything that's, that you've learned, um, I'm definitely open to that because I, I, I need to know, I wanna know more about it. Um, I have three boys and the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because my middle kid, my five-year-old Dylan, he's, he has autism. So it's, it's, just, it's very close to me. Um, I was just wondering if I can get a show of hands of people who know somebody directly outside of work who has autism. Okay. Um, my, my next, my first like three or four slides are gonna illustrate um, like there's a lot of people affected, like, you know, that they, they know or they know somebody directly. So these first four slides just kind of explain um, pretty much how it's been rising, the, the rise of, of, uh, of this, um, of autism. Okay. So... This is Dylan. He was diagnosed in January 2014. Um, he's my five-year-old. I have three boys, uh, Louis, Dylan, and Max, LBM. Um, so going into this, uh, I only knew about autism from the movie Rain Man. Uh, that's, it's not a good reference because Dustin Hoffman portrays a um, autistic savant and a lot of the there there aren't savants are not a majority um, like extremely smart in certain areas uh, the struggle the struggles are more real than what kind of Hollywood conveys um, another one another movie which is really good is the accountant anybody ever see that no it's a really cool action movie that kind of makes a person who's autistic out to be kind of like a superhero or whatever. It's pretty cool, but it's not all that glitz and glamour. Um, and in that movie, they do one thing I like about that movie is how they use a lot of the terminology around autistic, you know, autism and uh, kids. They they use it a lot. They like, use a lot of correct terminology. So it's that's a good thing. It increases awareness for for autism. Um, some of the real struggles are that parents and that autisms have are uh, just to kind of give you an idea, these kids, they, they eat drywall, they eat, my, Dylan eats dirt every now and then. Um, so my wife and I joke around, you know, he, he's got his minerals for the day, but they don't, they don't, they don't have like the, the ability to kind of see, you know, what's right and wrong a lot of the time. So, um, they hit themselves. Sometimes they're a threat to others because of their uncontrollable tantrums. Okay, some stats on autism. One in 68 are diagnosed with autism. Uh, the CDC, that's the, based on CDC stats from 2010. It takes six to eight years to come to these numbers, so these numbers are even higher right now. Um, so those numbers, yeah, those numbers are behind. That's how much it takes them to crunch the numbers, collect the data, all that stuff. 
this is a worldwide study. The numbers are higher in the U.S. alone. And uh, so every 20 minutes, another child is diagnosed with autism. More people are diagnosed with autism than AIDS, diabetes, and cancer combined. Um, and it's costing our nation billions of dollars. So this is Denzel Washington in the movie Training Day. And just pretend like he's autism. He's representing autism. And he's saying this with the same passion that he did in the movie. Does anybody see that movie, Training Day? Yeah, okay. Um, global warming experts have been known to predict global extinction in about 20 years. Um, by then, if you're going to look, I'm going to show you in, in my next slide another chart. By then, pretty much one in two children, or if not all children, based on these numbers, uh, will be diagnosed with autism. Um, some people have been known to predict by 2025, one in two children will be diagnosed with autism. Um, this is based on the current number of diagnoses that the CDC releases. Uh, it's a bit extreme, but I'm going to illustrate this in the next slide. So you can see in 1975, one in 5,000 children were diagnosed with autism. And then if you jump ahead to the end of the slide, there's a 40 person diagnosis difference within a period of two years. And that number is rising exponentially. Um, this is, it's officially an epidemic. A lot of people don't realize this, that how, how prominent it is that, that we kind of get to the bottom of this or we find a solution or find, find the cause. And that's, I'm going to be talking about the cause and the solutions in a couple of other slides here. The um, president of Autism Speaks, I'm sure you guys have heard of that. They do a lot of um, marketing for autism awareness, is basically pleading for a national plan. He states that it's a national emergency and that we need to, we need to get on top of it. Um, based on these numbers, I already gave that stat, never mind. So, when I say less prevalent in this slide here, um, I don't mean less important. These less prevalent diseases are not rising at a rate, I'm sorry, yeah, they're not rising at a rate as alarming as autism is. These, check out these numbers here for the, the first column is the number of children affected out of 100,000. And the second column is how much funding it's receiving. Um, if, just to kind of illustrate my point, if it's an epidemic, um, we, need, we need to get more funding. So this is why I'm trying to create, you know, talking about this and create more awareness because it just, it just needs a lot more, a lot more attention um, considering the urgency of the issue. So at the top of the list, um, 100 or 1,135 kids affected out of 100,000. And then the numbers just kind of go down for these other conditions. What is autism? This is the Google definition. Um, most definitions do not really reveal what autism is. Um, it's, it's just hard because it's hard to understand because it's, a, it's based on the brain, a dysfunction or a disconnection in the brain that all kids have different symptoms. Um, it is, it's not a single condition. That's why they use the abbreviation autism spectrum disorder. It's a spectrum of symptoms and, and conditions. Uh, if a person is on the spectrum, it just means that they have some form of autism. ASD is a name for a group of developmental disorders. It is a wide range of spectrum 
or a spectrum of symptoms, skills, and levels of diabetes, or I'm sorry, <laughs> disabilities. Um, conditions on the spectrum, just an example, a couple examples, are PDD, which is Pervasive Developmental Disorders, PDD NOS, Pervasive, pervasive Developmental Disorder, not otherwise specified, SDD, which is Specific Developmental Disorders, Asperger's, um, and then there's, there's more. People with ASD often have the following characteristics. Ongoing social problems, and that include difficulty communicating and interacting with others. There isn't one type of autism. There's pretty much a saying in the autism community that if you've met one autistic child or one child with autism, you've, seen, you've met one child with autism because the range is just, they all have different, different symptoms. So, it's a functional disconnection between the left and the right side of the brain. The left side of the brain is your, is the definite uh, logic, analysis, math, facts, memorization. The right side of the brain is your creativity, imagination, holistic thinking, nonverbal communication, and feelings. They have, they have trouble with this. The, the right side of the brain is lower, it's less developed. Um, this is, this is where the, the main hardship is with, with kids with autism. They can't, the creativity stuff, the stuff that's abstract, they're, they're, that level of the brain is, is a lot lower. So it's underdeveloped. Uh, this, this explains the ongoing social problems and difficulty communicating and interacting with others, nonverbal communication. A way I, can, I remember it is there's an acronym that my son's therapist taught me. It's called, it's BEX, B-E-C-S. So if, just so you remembering that, like just so you could know where, what part they're having trouble with is, BEX stands for behavioral, emotional, cognitive, and social. That's the area that they have trouble in. That's, that's the area of the brain that's underdeveloped. This is just kind of cool, I thought. Um, because it kind of shows the left and right side in relation to our, our industry. Okay. The neurons are not making the right connections. This is, this is the brain functionality. This is, in this part, on top of being underdeveloped, these neurons are kind of misfiring. The, it goes from your left side to your right side of the brain. The, the neurons in the brain are misfiring. They're not getting that, that feedback that they should be from the right side of the brain. So I'm tr I, I have a couple analogies here. I hope they help kind of people understand like how, what that looks like in a, in a kid with autism. Um, so what would you do if you're riding a train and it missed your stop and your cell phone was out of battery? You'd worry, things are unorganized and thrown off. You don't know what to do because there's nothing you can do and you have no control over the situation. Your thoughts, are const your thoughts constantly repeat in your head and you try to figure out how things will play out. Will, will the person picking me up be worried? How will I get a hold of them? How far is the next stop? Do the conductors think that no one's left on the train? The difference between you and a person with autism in this situation is that you have control over these thoughts. You can handle the situation through rationality. Autistic brains are missing that rationality since the neurons aren't making the right connections to the calming emotions needed. Um, it's very, it's a, it's a very close mindset to, to OCD in a way. Um, the, actually, the therapy that I'm taking my son, they treat OCD as well because it's a disconnect. It's, it's also a disconnection in the brain. Your executive functions are a simultaneously a simultaneous coordination between specific parts of the brain to get you to perform tasks that, to the best of your ability, it all, it, your brain conducts these operations within fractions of a second. The specific parts involved in execution 
or I'm, I'm sorry, in exitive, ex bleh, executive functions are this. The executive functions are controlled by your frontal lobe. There's an interaction between your frontal lobe, your basal ganglia, and your cerebellum. Your frontal lobe is responsible for movements, movements thoughts, and behaviors. Your basal ganglia is a mediator between the frontal lobe and the cerebellum. Your cerebellum is responsible for handling visual spatial. It, it, it times the coordination of your body in space, and it tells you where your body is in space and is there for balance. It also works with your um, vestibular, your inner ear um, mechanism for um, balance and coordination. So an example of your frontal lobe, basal ganglia, and cerebellum, how they work, how they're working together is, here's another analogy. Your dog is letting you know that you need to go, that, he, that they need to go to the bathroom. The frontal lobe, when you see that, when you see your dog letting you know this, your frontal lobe says, I have to get up now and put my shoes on and get, and get the leash. The basal ganglia, you are about to get up, so see if the cerebellum has any suggestions before you do this. Your cerebellum. You've been sitting on the couch for two hours, binge watching Stranger Things. You've been sitting on your left calf, and it's asleep now. Your frontal lobe says you're going to need to move slowly because I, sh I should drink some, or perhaps I should drink some water before I go for a walk since I'm a little hungover from the wedding last night. So the brain is the control center. These are the, the effects of a dysfunctioning brain. Your brain is a control center. When your brain is off, your whole system gets thrown off. And these are some common problems that you see. I have in the list in the slide. Not only do you have, do you have to deal with autistic tendencies, you're also stuck dealing with sort of a byproduct of autism. Anxiety, depression, and obsessive compulsions. Trouble sleeping. Some have seizures. Um, again, when your brain is off, your, your gut is off, and your gut is your entire digestive system. So that's why you see a lot of autistic kids. That's why you keep them away from gluten, um, certain other dietary things, because your, your gut is almost like your second brain. Um, it has as many neurons as a dog's brain, and there's constant communication between your gut and your brain. Um, so. The brain's thrown off in, the aut in, a, in a kid with autism or dysfunction or disconnection, then your, your digestive system is thrown off. So that's why you see a lot of uh, sensitivities and, and dietary problems and other things. Um, sensory integration disorder, uh, sensory signals are distorted. They're not clean, they're not crisp. There is no diagnosis and symptoms. There, there is no medical detection or cure for autism. It is diagnosed by symptoms, just seeing and recognizing symptoms. Um, parents may begin to question the health of their children when developmental milestones are not met, including age-appropriate motor movement and speech production. Um, some symptoms. Difficulty using and understanding language. Difficulty relating to people, objects, and events. For example, lack of eye contact, pointing behavior, and lack of facial expressions. Usual, unusual play with toys and other objects. Difficulty with changes in routine or familiar surroundings. Repetitive body movements and behavior patterns, such as hand flapping, hair twirling, foot tapping, and more complex movements. Inability to cuddle or be comforted, treat people like objects, difficulty regulating behavior and emotions, which may result in temper tantrums, anxiety and, and aggression, emotional breakdowns. Um, an ex example of, child, of a child treating people like objects. When we first found out about Dylan having autism, my wife, she would have some breakdowns sometimes and you know, she would, we would she would cry, we'd get emotional. Um, so Dylan would kind of, he, he would see that early on in his 
in his, uh, you know, right after that, and he he wouldn't. They don't react. They don't. They they look at her like a like an object. He looked at her, and then he would just kind of continue what he what he was doing, um, which is usually he, they, they're called perseverations. Like when they do the hand flapping and the running back and forth, or running around in circles. So that, that he would just continue doing that kind of stuff. The difference is like my one year old, he'll see that like he he's like you have a kid that's not disconnected, they just, they, they can read you like very early in life. They can, they can see that, you're, that you're, you're hurt or you're emotional or they can, you know, anger or whatever. They, they, they're, they're really good at, at determining that stuff. I didn't realize this until, you know, dealing with Dylan. Um, examples of, let's see. So, it was hard to tell with Dylan because different, different autistic kids have um, different levels of anxiety, um, I'm sorry, different levels of, of their autism. They, although they don't diagnose that anymore, where they say like they're, they're high functioning autism, low functioning autism, um, they don't diagnose that. They just say that you're on the spectrum right now. Um, but it, it's, it's hard if, if you have somebody that's maybe in the middle somewhere, it's hard to tell you know, it's like those, these symptoms that I described to you, it, these are also behaviors that occur in regular kids. Um, just kids that, you know, where their brain is functioning normally. But the trick is to kind of look, look for these things um, in context. Um, it's, it's hard, and it was hard to tell with Dylan. Um, I, I partially was in denial, I guess, about it when, when we were first going but when he turned two it was kind of obvious but i was still in denial but anyways so um dylan is five and he does not talk he can say words but he does not say them at the appropriate times when he was young we just thought he was a late bloomer it may sound obvious and easy to catch but when you when it's your own kid denial sets in hard Hard to t it's hard to tell because a lot of these behaviors are considered normal to some degree in certain stages, and sometimes the stages are longer than others. Like walking, you have late walkers and you have late talkers. Um, look for the, look for, like I just mentioned, look for appropriate, the appropriate time and the appropriate degree. Um, this, is, this is also hard to, ter to determine early in, in, in the early stages while they're developing. What causes autism? The cause is unknown. Scientists are looking into gene, a gene or genes. On the CDC website, it, does, it states, many scientists agree that autism is called, caused by genes. I don't like that statement because it's, it's not really a fact. They put it on there for some reason. Um, diagnosis is climbing at a staggering rate that can't be explained by genetics alone. Genes take many generations in order to, for traits to become a part of them. Just think about the theory of evol evolution. Um, how long would it take for the tadpole to get arms or whatever? You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, like, that's a genetic thing that happens over a lot of, uh, you know, big, large amount of time. The one thing... Epigenetics, has anybody ever heard or done any reading on epigenetics here? No? Okay. Epigenetics is the study of changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. So basically what that means is that your genes can be influenced, the behavior of your genes can be influenced um, by environmental things right away. It, and it's not changing the way that your gene is behaving, if that makes any sense. Does that make, like the, the makeup of that gene. There's something that's put on top of it that, that uh, of your genes that, that influences the behavior. Um, epigenetics can be a key player in how environmental influences can be rapidly attaching themselves to our genes, which our kids can inherit from us right away. The good thing is that these things can be changed right away in a positive way. 
um, a combination of environmental influences may be making a person more likely to develop autism when they are genetically predisposed to autism. The environmental influences further increase the risk factor of autism rather than cause it. What happened here? Sorry. The critical period may have been shut down. There's another cause, what, they, what they're looking into, this has to do with neuroplasticity and just child development early on. Your critical may, period may have been shut down too early or was overstimulated for some reason, most likely an environmental influence. If you want a great representation of how technology can be an environmental influence through epigenetics, there's um, a di um, what is it? documentary that I watched called Disconnected, D-S-K-N-E-C-T-D. I'll send out this uh, presentation too if you guys want to refer to it. Um, get Disconnected, it's on Amazon Prime, it's free, you can watch it, it's really good. It talks about distraction and how we need downtime for reflection, among many other things, and how how that affects our behavior socially. And there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of studies out there that kind of show that it's, it's not having a good effect on us. Is there a cure? There is not a cure yet, but there are treatments, there are therapies. Um, they, there's tons of therapies and treatments out there. There's homeopathic therapies, there's um, the, the, the ones that doctors recommend are ABA, speech, occupational, behavioral, physical, and a lot of other of those. There's medication, there's diet in combination with medication, diet, homeopathic remedies, detoxification, and many more. Although people on the spectrum have been able to lose their diagnosis to just ADD or OCD, they, they're never really considered cured, but there are cases that they do lose their diagnosis. Um, Jenny McCarthy's kid lost his diagnosis. He's not, he's not on the spectrum technically. I think he has, they just, he just has OCD now. Or ADD, sorry. So neuroplasticity is what my, the therapy and a lot of therapies are based on now for a lot of things. Um, before scientists believed in localization and then there's neuroplasticity. Lo localization, localizationists believed that a particular area of the brain, if a t particular area of the brain was damaged, it was lost forever. Since that, that particular area was only part of the brain, was the only part of the brain that could perform a specific task. This is no longer the belief. Um, neuroplasticity has taken that over and uh, it's, there's a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, really good, just, it's just about neuroplasticity and how the brain is plastic. What they mean by the brain is plastic, it means that the brain can change itself. Um, the brain can remap lost functionality to a, to a different area if you train it to do so. An example of that would be a stroke victim has brain trauma, was, was thought to be incurable due to beliefs in localizationism. If somebody had a stroke maybe 20 or 30 years ago, they would say, you're incurable, we can't do anything for you. 20 or 30 years later, they're applying neuroplastic um, therapies to stroke, stroke victims that, that had that happen to them a while ago, and the brain is able to remap itself amazingly to a different area those, those lost functionalities or whatever it's it's curing itself like they're it, it's 20, 20 or 30 years after which is amazing um, so yeah that's i was just reading the rest of my thing. most medical treatments are now neuroplasticity based an example my older son louis he has a lazy eye his eye doctor has him wearing a patch that covers his good eye for about eight hours a day 
so that it forces the use of his bad eye. That's a perfect example of the brain remapping itself and healing itself. If you're forcing that use, you're, it's, uh, this only works because he is still in his critical period. The critical period in kids for this particular, for his eye, I guess, is till about seven or eight. So he's still wearing it. He's been wearing it for over a year. Or about, about two years, actually. But it's working. He went from 2030 to 2070. So we're trying to get him to 2020. In that, in that eye. So dealing with autism. It's hard to take them anywhere because the little things set them off. There are little things that set them off. Keeping away from gluten. If you're in a store, if you're going grocery shopping, and there's bread everywhere and gluten stuff, he, they have emotional breakdowns. Um, Dylan's most difficult symptom that we had to deal with a lot was emotional breakdown when he went places. If he saw food he couldn't have or just had a hard time transitioning or being in different surroundings. Um, one of the things is it's hard, and I know like it's just us being weird. People stare at you when this happens. It's a hard thing to deal with, and they're not, sometimes they're judging, sometimes they're not. They give us dirty looks or whatever. Um, what helps is some people come up and they talk. They talk to him or us when he's having a public breakdown, which eases the level of anxiety and is way better than staring, <laughs> staring at you. Um, we have to take him out. We have to take him out whether he has fits or not. Life goes on and we just need to power through that, through that judgment of people not knowing what we're actually dealing with. People don't, or please don't be quick to judge the next time you see a parent struggling with their kid's behavior. The, you know, kids with Down syndrome, you could, you could physically tell that they have Down syndrome. Uh, parents of kids with autism, they, they don't have that, you can't tell. Um, so a lot of, you know, I get, we get dirty looks. I even had some lady yell at me for not disciplining my kid, you know, and it's just, I got into an argument. It wasn't worth it with her, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's, that sort of stuff happens. And, and just with the increase of diagnosis and, and kids that are out there with, with this dysfunction, um, you, you just never know. They're, you know, it, it'll, you'll see more than, more than you know, I guess. Um, there are more things being catered to kids with autism, but parents are, are trying to include their disconnected kids in everyday life, and it's difficult. It's good, it's good for them to be involved in going out and doing things normally instead of avoiding these things because it's easier. But we need to increase awareness so that people aren't so quick to judge. So Dylan's treatment, I have one more slide, just so you know. Um, we're, I'm taking him to this place called Brain Balance. Um, what I like is they have, what I like about them is they have a structured approach in diagnosing developmental s status and brain functionality. The therapy starts from, a, from the ground up in terms of infant and, and or child development. Getting rid of primitive reflexes is one of the things that, you're, that you start with in this therapy. Common pr primitive reflexes, Moreau, uh, which is the starter reflex, the palmer grasp, and palmer reflex moves the toes away from the shins and curls the toes down. Executive functions, which is your cognitive control, are built on top of the primitive reflexes as part of normal frontal lobe development. As the executive functions develop, the child will appear to have lost a primit the primitive reflexes, but they're just masked in a sense, and they will remain this way forever unless some sort of brain trauma interrupts, interrupts it like a stroke. So Dylan's still showing primitive reflexes, which he's not supposed to. So we've gotten, we've, we're building on top of those primitive reflexes. And that's, that's something that should have been done when he was one in a, in a normal development, development 
and neural development for a child. We're working on eye contact and spatial awareness, neuroplasticity-based exercises, channeling the input through the left brain in order to trigger right brain activity. So we're trying to bring that right brain up. This gets the brain to remap itself on developing the right brain function so that the brain can start making more of the right neurological connections between the left and the right brain. Conclusion, um, many of you already are already doing this, but diet, just be more aware because that's this is kind of where epigenetics come in. Whatever you put in your body, the brain becomes as well. You are what you eat. Eat healthy, stay away from GMO, processed pesticides, antibiotics. Eat good fats like fish oil. Um, an, an example of that, like, you know, your diet, you are what you eat. Like the axon, which is the, the long part of a neuron in your brain, is made up of mostly fat. So if you're eating good fat, that just promotes better functionality in your brain because that stuff's going to your brain and that's becoming you. It's, you are what you eat, so. Regulate screen time, avoid distractions and other, and I'm sorry, avoid distractions in order to give yourself downtime for reflection, daydreaming, and processing of your recent past experiences. Remember how epigenetics plays a role in being a part of the, the possible cause. Talk to the kid that the mom in the store is struggling with. Make them feel better. This is up to you. It's, you know, some, some parents may not like that. I don't know. We appreciate that when people try to comfort or just, you know, sometimes just, you know, even with normal kids, just somebody comes up to them and talks to them and they just calm down right away because they react better to their parents <laughs> or to people that aren't their parents. Um, comfort them and don't stare. Just be aware that, you, you know, if you see somebody in the store and don't judge that parent because they might be dealing with autism. Uh, donate to charities and give money directly to families that need it. I will send out a link to a charity that I would, that I would promote that, that gives money directly to the families. Um, but I, at this point, you know, research donations and, you know, all that stuff, we, it's, it's needed because of the, how it's an epidemic. See if your church if, has a need for this kind of help. I know in our church, you know, we try, um, they don't have a special needs, but they have some people that are willing to help watch them because um, they're, they're just different things that they have to de deal with, like I went over. So they're willing to listen to us and, and take, you know, like we tell them what, what to watch out for and, you know, just kind of whatever their bad habits are. And, um, spread the word. It is an official epidemic, so um, I, I, that's why I'm doing this. I wish, like, you know, if you, when you get, like, that little ribbon for autism awareness, I wish, like, this information would just kind of just get put in your brain somehow, like the matrix or something. But uh, that's it. Thank you. It was 40, 45 minutes less than my pastor. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send it out.